Who's faithful forever, whose love never fails, whose goodness is, is inexplicable. And we thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing in our lives. We sing for joy at the work of your hands. We pray, Lord, you'd be magnified in our midst this morning. That you'd be glorified here. That we would leave seeing you more clearly and having met with you. So have your way in this place, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Tracy's going to come and lead us through children's church. Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to see you this morning on this glorious day. Sorted out what I want to do, but God 
decided to take me in a different direction and he'll do the same for you guys all through your lives but he'll always have the best for you you just need to trust and I've got one more one of my other favorite um, I'm not going to read the whole chapter because it's quite big but from Ephesians or the New Testament chapter 1 it tells us that God has an unchanging plan to adopt us into his family through the Lord Jesus so he's making every single one of us, so we have to include the adults as well, his sons and daughters. And that means you know how much your mum and dad loves you. And our Father God loves us even more. Yeah, exactly. So he's going to, if we you know, follow him and we listen to him, he's going to guide you on all the right things. So any worries we've got, don't worry. How can we take them to it? What can we do? If we're worried, what could we do? Do you think you could tell him? Yeah, we could. We could tell him in our prayers, right? And we can share those things with him and he will help you. He mightn't give you the answer that you think he's going to give, but he will always to guide you in the best direction for you. So thank you very much for listening today. And I'm going to pass you across to Pastor Josh. I'm going to read from John chapter 15 again. John chapter 15 and verse 1, Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Well, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you this so that your joy may be, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends for everything that I've learned from my father I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the father will give you. This is my command, love each other. We've been here for quite a while. I'll try and shut up about it today, hopefully. Um, and we gave some thought last week to the simplicity of the instruction and the significance of the outcome um, and so in trying to get this finished <laughs> I want to ask this question how do you, how do you know if you're abiding in Christ? How do we know if we abide in him? Because the only thing that I think through John 15 tells me as a measure is in verse 10. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I've kept my father's commands and remain in his love. We're not chasing after the fruit. We're not chasing after the glorious things. We're in pursuit of him, to abide in him. And I'm going to tell you that the measure of that is obedience. The measure of that is obedience. 
the reality of my abiding is outworked in the way in which I live. So in 1 John 2 and verse 3, it says, We know that we've come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says I know him but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. And the measure of whether you know him or not apparently is obedience, not information. The measure of whether you know him or not is obedience, not information. So conversely, in Titus 1 and verse 16, it says of false teachers, they claim to know God, but by their actions they deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. There's a lot of people who pursue a lot of knowledge. There's a lot of Christians who've read a lot of books. But what demonstrates whether you know him or not is what you do. Information is not the sum of it. And apparently, by your actions, you can deny him. And so 1 John 2 and verse 6 says that if I'm in him, my life reflects the way he lived. And I'm going to tell you Jesus' life is overwhelmingly characterized by obedience. John 15 and verse 10 If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. In John 6, verse 38, Jesus says, I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. John 12, and verse 49. Jesus says, I did not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I've spoken. John 5 and verse 19, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. Philippians 2 verse 8. Says Christ being found in appearance as a man, humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. That's the way Christ lived. He did what he was told to do. He said what he was told to say. He didn't do what he wanted. I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And I hope that over the last however many weeks, I've created a desire for you to abide in Christ. That as we've considered the word of God together, as we've thought about what that means, there's been some element of desire that that would be the reality of your life. That you would bear much fruit and fruit that lasts. That you would ask whatever you wish and it would be answered for you. That you'd have complete joy
But I want to tell you, to live in him, you have to be obedient. And the reality is, most of us struggle with that. I think we're quite good at the desires. We want this. We'd like that. We'd like to be here. We'd like to do that. But we're not necessarily great at the process. We're good at perceiving an outcome and going, that's where I want to be in my life. But we're not really great at walking the journey out. In some of that stuff. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. That's an assurance. If you just do what he says, you'll get there. Much fruit. Fruit that lasts. But I have to do what he says. I don't think I'm expected to be sinless. 1 John 1 verse 8 says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we've not, and not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. You know that Galatians 5.17 says the flesh desires what's contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. And they're in conflict with each other, so you're not to do whatever you want. The reality is there's an ingoing struggle in me between my flesh and my spirit. And sometimes, my flesh gets the better of me. But here's the expectation of anybody who's living in Christ. 1 John 3 verse 5. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. Here's the distinction. I might fall into sin. I might slip up. I might make a mistake. But I am not making it the pattern or routine of my life. I am not continuing in it. I am not settling for what I might get away with. And we talked last week about the fact that God is at work in us, empowering us to do what he's asked us to do. So I walk by the Spirit and I won't gratify the desires of the flesh. That's Galatians 5.16. It's the one that precedes the verse that tells me my flesh and my spirit are in battle. But I have said this before and I'll say it again. I'm convinced. I have the capacity to justify something to myself that's wrong. I am convinced I have the capacity to excuse sin in my life when actually he's empowering me to overcome it. I have the capacity to explain to myself why it's okay to do the stuff I know that's wrong and silence the voice in me that tells me it's wrong. That's not obedience. That's not obedience. 
when you know it's wrong and you do it anyway. It's not obedience. And I think one of the primary measures we use to do that is other people. What they're doing, how they're living. We're back to being like the disciples, comparing ourselves amongst each other and deciding who's the greatest. 1 Timothy 3, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 2. It says, speaking of the last times, it says, People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. That's a fun list, isn't it? My scale's not what everybody else is like. My measure is not how I'm doing in comparison to everybody else. Those people are apparently in the church. They've got a form of godliness. The people who are lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. They're church people. That's, that's, they've got a form of godliness but deny its power. They're church people. I do not want to rely on the fact that I'm doing better than them. Because that's not a measure of obedience. And I'm not living to a standard that the world has set. I'm not measuring myself by what's culturally deemed as appropriate. And I talked to you a few weeks ago about the fact that I believed self-righteousness. Sat in opposition to abiding. Let me draw this distinction. Self-righteousness will always tell you why you're okay. Self-righteousness will always tell you why you're doing all right. Self-righteousness will always tell you why you're doing well. I mean, the rich young ruler... Mark chapter 10. It says, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honour your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I've kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. He comes to Jesus 
and says, what do I need to do to get eternal life? What do I need to do to get to heaven? What do I need to do to be right with God? And Jesus says, you know what the law says. I've kept it. I've done it. I am righteous. I am righteous. How are you doing, wisdom? You okay? Good. I am righteous. And Jesus says, actually, there's one thing you lack. There's something more you can do. There's more to this. Go and sell everything. Give it to the poor. That'll get your riches in heaven and then you can come follow me. And suddenly his heart sinks. If it was a sincere question, if the question was, what do I need to do? Because I'm going to do whatever you say. Surely, that you sell your stuff and or at least you're going away thoughtful. But actually he comes to demonstrate, I'm doing this. I've got this right. I've kept all of the law. And when Jesus says, actually, there's more. I want to live a life that bears much fruit. I want to live a life that whatever I ask is done for me. I want to live a life where my joy is complete. So I'm not going to spend my time explaining to myself why I'm right when I'm wrong. I'm not going to spend my time telling myself how good I'm doing in comparison to everybody else when actually he's calling me to more. I'm not going to fight to convince myself everything's okay when it's not. I want to be obedient. And I'm going to say the hallmark of obedience is love. The hallmark of obedience is love. John 15 and verse 10. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this. Love each other. As I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay one down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the father will give you. This is my command love each other. 1 John 3 and verse 23 says, and this is his command, to believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ 
and to love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. Jesus wants to explain that obedience is the measure of remaining in his love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. And then immediately follows that by saying, this is my command. Love each other as I've loved you. So you must love one another. And then in verse 17, he repeats it. This is my command. Love each other. Love each other as I have loved you. This is my command, love each other. Love one another as he has commanded us. One of the measures I'm going to use against my own life is going about how I abide in him is how I treat other people. Is what I think about other people. Is what my heart says about other people. Because his command's not unclear. Love each other. Love each other. And I can give myself all sorts of reasons to not. I can tell you why it would be okay for me to... You, you don't know what they did to me. And you, you don't understand. We're just chalk and cheese. Look, we just rub each other up. Here's what I understand. I have never been de deserving of Christ's love for me. I have never been deserving of Christ's love for me. I didn't earn it. I'm still not worthy of it. loves me with an everlasting love. When I get to thinking about loving people as Christ's loved me, suddenly this isn't on basis of merit. It's not about who they are how good they are or what they've done. It's not about whether or not I think they're a particularly special person or not. Oh. 
love that was totally undeserved was extended to me. And it continues to be. So here's how 1 John 4 puts it. 1 John 4 and verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit and we have seen and testified that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. Yeah. And this is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment in this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because the fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loves us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they've not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Don't stop messing about. He's not mincing his words or beating around the bush. You don't love, you don't know God. You claim to know God and hate your brother and sister, you're a liar. thing that apparently is meant to make this distinctive from people on the face of the earth. This is how you'll know, this is how they'll know you're my disciples. What is it? Your love for one another? This is how they'll know your love for one another? John 15, the verse, the first 17 verses that we spent a while there. I think it's got an awful lot to say. I could spend longer there, but I think I'm boring you. So we're not going to. Abide in me. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And if you just stay with me, you'll bear much fruit. Fruit that lasts. Ask whatever you wish and it'll be done for you. Your joy will be made complete. But staying with him involves being obedient to him.
Not telling yourself you're doing fine, but listening to what he says. Not giving yourself a half-hearted definition of love, because it takes the box. And when you come to him going, aren't I doing really well? And he goes, one thing you lack. Going, all right, God, teach me. Teach me. It isn't really complicated. You stay with him and you do what he says. That's it. But you do have to do what he says. And I am persuaded more and more that most of us are shutting him up when he's saying stuff we don't like. We're silencing his voice when it doesn't suit our purpose. When that small voice tells us, hey, you shouldn't have done that. When it's going, don't do it. Don't do it. But we adamantly do it anyway. concerned about loving like Jesus loved us. Because we can tell ourselves we're doing alright because we're reasonably nice to people. <laughs> we're not actually concerned about the command. Love each other as I have loved you. So you must love one another. I've told you before, I think some of the most pathetic definitions I've heard of love have been in church. Because that way I can satisfy myself that I'm doing alright. But the way I'm going to love you like him is by abiding. It's by being in him. It's by being empowered by him for it. But I have to have the desire to do it as well. These things work in tandem. He asks me to do something, but he gives me the ability. He actually empowers me. So I might sin, but I don't keep on sinning because grace teaches me to say no to ungodliness. Because I'm walking by the Spirit, so I don't gratify the desires of the flesh. I might not be perfectly loving. But I'm going to get there. Why? Because I'm going to do what he says. And when I get it wrong, I'm going to go back to him. And I'm going to go, God, I didn't know. I got it wrong. I'm sorry. But I need you because apart from you, I can do nothing. Yeah. And so I live my life in this tandem of I'm doing what he says while he's empowering me to do it. I'm working in the process. I'm working at my salvation while he works in me to will and to act according to his purpose. So how do I know I'm abiding in him? I keep his commands. I'm a perfect no. But the overwhelming desire of my heart is to do what he wants me to do. It's to keep doing what he wants me to do. It's not to tell myself I'm okay not doing what he's asked of me. And as we remind ourselves of Christ's love for us, we're going to break bread. Because this is love, not that we love God, but that he loves us. And he sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Christ who didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped at, 
but humbled himself and being found in human likeness became obedient to death and with death on a cross. Greater love is no one than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friend. Let's eat and drink in remembrance of him. Thank you. 
is still at work in our lives. Yeah. Teaching us to say no to ungodliness. Yeah. Finishing the work you started, Lord. Yeah. And we rejoice in that. Yeah. And we thank you that it enables us to be obedient. to walk in all you've called us to, to live as you've instructed. Lord, we want to love each other in a way that reflects your glory and goodness, that doesn't settle for some earthly standard, that doesn't justify anything less. But Lord, we pray that as people encounter us, they might know the love of God. We want to do all that you've asked us to, so that we might abide in you, so that you might be glorified in the fruitfulness of our lives. So have your way, we pray in Jesus' name. And help us as we seek the new people, for your glory and your honor. Before you rush off, next week is the end of the month, and so we'll be eating together here. If you want to stay around and join us, we did it at the end of June. Obviously, the end of July, we were at the beach and we had a picnic. But if you're able to stick around next week and have lunch with us, that'd be great. Good morning. God bless you. It's great to see you, and we'll see you soon.